Ah, Square Enix. We love them for their amazing games, we hate them for their baffling business decisions. You never quite know where it's going to go. But this year, 2022, it felt like there were so many games from the publisher being released that they were almost competing with themselves. Some are Japanese mobile games, other are massive releases beloved by everyone, but most have probably been completely forgotten. So let's have some dumb fun and break down the 35, yes, 35 games released by Square Enix in 2022. Bravely Default Brilliant Lights is the third mobile spin-off release for the series and, like its predecessors, it's Japanese only. It plays just like previous Bravely games and though it features a new cast, the old characters can be met and recruited. It did quite well too with 4 million users registered for the free-to-play title in less than two weeks. Have you ever heard of the Square Enix Collective? A division of Square Enix Europe, it helps publish indie games while allowing the developers to retain creative control. It's a nice idea and led to the release of Circuit Superstars on the PS4 in January. It did release initially on the Xbox One last year and is supposedly coming to the Switch this year too, but there's been no word on that front. Still, how often do we get top-down racers anymore? The Life is Strange Remastered Collection combines the original game and Before the Storm into one package in case anyone missed these games the first time around. Released in February, this version came to last-gen consoles, the Stadia, and PC, while a Switch version didn't arrive until September, where it was called the Arcadia Bay Collection. I've not played it, but I guess that means it's not remastered on Switch? It feels like ages ago, but February is also when Square Enix released Kingdom Hearts for the Switch as a cloud version. Dubbed the Integrum Masterpiece because, of course, it collected every Kingdom Hearts game except Melody of Memory, but as a cloud version. Not only did it piss off fans, but it killed trust that other games could be faithfully ported to the Switch. Ironically, Square Enix later proved that a fantastic looking game could run amazingly on the Switch, but that's for later in the year. Released seven days later, Voice of Cards The Forsaken Maiden was the sequel to the original Isle Dragon Roars, though they can be played in any order. Notably, Yoko Taro serves as creative director and features a unique style that emulates a tabletop RPG. Critics felt it improved upon the original, but was still essentially the same game. Six days later, the Pixel Remaster releases came to an end with Final Fantasy VI. There would be much rejoicing, if you wanted to play it on PC and download a font mod. But if you want the remasters on consoles, well, keep waiting. For now. Hopefully. Ah, Babylon's Fall. It arrived on March 3rd to a collective who cares, as few liked it and fewer played it. I think it's best summed up by its Steam stats, which reached an all-time high of 1,166 concurrent players that eventually fell to just one by May. Wow. But hey, at least a literal day later, Square Enix released one of the best strategy RPGs of the year with Triangle Strategy. Utilizing that oh-so-lovely HD 2D, it stood out in the same vein as Octopath Traveler while seemingly taking naming lessons from that game too. With multiple endings and the promise that the choices mattered, players were quickly enamored. Oh, Chocobo GP, you look to have so much promise. And then Square Enix's business decisions clipped your wings. Released only six days after Triangle Strategy, Chocobo GP decided a season pass system was a good idea for the kart racer when, no, no it wasn't. It took too long to earn the rewards without spending money, and even then, the free currency had an expiration date. I mean, until doing this video, I had no clue that it had released four seasons of content this year. Square Enix rounded out March with the befuddling Stranger of Paradise Final Fantasy Origin. Edgy to the point of hilarity, the game turned out to be pretty good from a gameplay standpoint. Its take on a more brutal Final Fantasy with combat lifted from Neo, appropriate considering it's the same team, worked well enough. Sure, it's goofy, but with the right mindset, it can still be fun. Plus, it received DLC updates throughout the year. Who doesn't want another opportunity to fight Gilgamesh? The fact that Chrono Cross got re-released in April is fantastic. That it also included Radical Dreamers, a text adventure that serves as a precursor to Cross, makes it even better. Now, if only Chrono Cross actually ran well and could hit 30 FPS, a threshold the original never struggled with. It's flawed, but it's still worth checking out, I promise. Echoes of Mana is another mobile release from Square Enix, but this one actually got a release in the West. 
The game mostly follows the series formula, but also celebrates its legacy with memory gems, which augment the player while featuring artwork of characters from across the series. Not much has been said about it or its success, but it's there. And then there is the Centennial Case Ashijima story, a May release that I hadn't heard of, got no ads for, and saw nobody talking about despite the fact that it was released on PC, Switch, and PlayStation. Maybe it's because it's an honest-to-god FMV mystery game, something that's only gotten rarer over time, but has popped up in recent years. Looking over some reviews, it seems to have an excellent Japanese cast and comes across as a decent Netflix drama with some legitimately good mysteries. Seems it was just lost in the shuffle. Dragon Quest Builders is a great game that's a fantastic alternative to Minecraft if you want a bit more direction in your building games. And in late May, it got ported to mobile devices. I don't know why you'd want to play it there over other options, but there you go. Speaking of ports, June saw Final Fantasy VII Remake Intergrade ported to the PC. Perfect if you don't have a PS5, which considering the fact that they're still hard to come by, you likely don't. But yes, the upgraded Final Fantasy VII Remake. It's great. Play it. At the end of June, Outriders World Slayer was released, which served as an expansion for the original game. Its main goal was to expand upon the endgame, which it succeeded in, but it was derided for not really bringing anything new to the formula. Critics agreed that the game overall is a fun throwback to cooperative shooters, but the story was lackluster. Best played with friends if you're into the gameplay style. Power Wash Simulator, released in mid-July on Xbox, had taken off from its initial PC release last year and serves as the other indie game from the Square Enix Collective. Being a part of Game Pass certainly expanded the number of people who tried it and let them experience the weird satisfaction of cleaning with ever larger tasks. The simulator is strangely relaxing and even offers co-op. Just make sure to check those nooks and crannies. The fact that the West got Live Alive localized is a minor miracle. That it was remastered using HD2D is incredible. To many, it's their game of the year, bringing together seven stories across time with each offering something unique in terms of gameplay. It really makes classic Square Enix fans hope they do the same to other unlocalized SNES RPGs. Octopath Traveler Champions of the Continent was originally released in Japan in 2020 and finally got a Western release this past July. Serving as a prequel to the original game, this free-to-play mobile title retains much of the style and gameplay, but with in-app purchases. It seems fine for a mobile game, though it made little waves upon release. Announced to celebrate the 20th anniversary of the series, Fullmetal Alchemist Mobile finally released in Japan on August 4th and serves as a retelling of the story through 3D visuals, full voice acting, and new animation. Gameplay-wise, it's a strategy RPG, and frankly, it seems a shame to keep it locked to Japan with gotcha elements. In September, the Voice of Cards trilogy came to an end with The Beast of Burden. It attempted to introduce some new mechanics to help differentiate the gameplay, but critics felt it was still a bit undercooked. The music and artwork were praised across the board, making for a unique but perhaps overlooked trilogy. Hey, remember when Square Enix announced that Dragon Quest X would be getting an offline version during a Dragon Quest-focused stream? It seemed like a perfect way for Western fans to finally enjoy what that game had to offer. Yeah, that came out in Japan on September 15th, and there's still no indication that it'll be localized. Maybe it'll happen someday or year. 2022 felt like the year of the strategy RPG, so let's add another one to the pile with September 22nd's The Dio Field Chronicle. However, this is a real-time strategy that only pauses when issuing orders, making it a tad more freeform. Critics agreed that the art is great, but with its desire to create a gritty story, there are too many stoic characters that barely develop. Different, but not entirely refined. It's been a long time since the Valkyrie series has gotten any kind of love, but Square Enix gave it another chance with Valkyrie Elysium's release on September 29th. Unfortunately, most found the story and characters to be pretty underwhelming, with events happening at a glacial pace. However, once combat eventually opened up, there was fun to be found. It's not exactly what fans wanted, but it's something. We may not have gotten Kingdom Hearts on the Switch without resorting to a cloud version, but the same can't be said of Nier Automata. Released in early October, the game was already a classic, but the port received wide acclaim with many believing it to be one of the best on the system. So yeah, if you haven't picked it up before and only have a Switch, it's a good option. Did you know that Neo The World Ends With You arrived on Steam this year? Probably not, no. Square Enix didn't advertise its freedom from the Epic Game Store at all, instead announcing it on the day of its release to absolutely no fanfare. 
Is it any wonder this game has struggled to sell? Originally released on the Wii in 2012, Dragon Quest X as an MMO has been going for a long time, with it recently receiving a fifth expansion. It's been ported many times, and that includes the Switch, which receives an all-in-one package for the game, combining everything released so far. Naturally, this is Japan only, so we're out of luck. Released on October 27th, Star Ocean The Divine Force is a step up in the series after the previous game. It's still not considered a top-tier RPG, but those who want a more sci-fi influenced story could find some enjoyment, especially as many consider it a throwback to the PS2 era of RPGs. With so much release this year, it's hard to imagine it won't get lost in the shuffle. Dubbed Square Enix's Rune Factory, Harvestella launched in early November and combines RPG combat and farm sim elements into an enjoyable blend that may not bring anything new, but does provide a fun mix. Really, that's all that needs to be said, as that description will either entice you or repel you. Released on November 11th, Tactics Ogre Reborn is a remaster of a remake, taking the PSP version of Let Us Cling Together and revising the battle mechanics as well as adding full English voice acting to the package. It's considered the definitive version of a fantastic strategy RPG. As of this video's release, there are still four more Square Enix games to come out in December, so there's no real sense of their reception yet. On December 1st, Romancing Saga Minstrel Song Remastered will be released. The game is a remaster of the PS2 remake of the original game and promises upscaled graphics, improved gameplay, and additional elements. The standard things you expect from remasters anymore. More exciting for me personally is Dragon Quest Treasures, which releases on December 9th. This is a prequel spin-off to Dragon Quest XI that features Eric and his sister traveling to another world where they must work together with monsters to find seven legendary treasures. Like most things Dragon Quest, it looks completely charming, so here's hoping it lives up to my personal hype. The best thing to come out of the compilation of Final Fantasy VII, Crisis Core serves as a prequel focusing on Zack Fair. Releasing on December 13th, this remaster promises upgraded HD visuals and a revised battle system that takes elements from Final Fantasy VII Remake. It also features a brand new dub featuring the actors from Remake, as it's seen as a proper prequel to those games as well. Absolutely worth checking out. Finally, there's Valkyrie Profile Lenneth, a PSP remake of the original Valkyrie Profile that's receiving a straight port to PS4 and PS5. It was initially supposed to release in conjunction with Valkyrie Elysium, but was pushed back to ensure the port's quality. Though criticized for its slow story pacing, the game is considered a cult classic well worth playing when it launches on December 22nd. While some of these games had time to shine on their own, most times it felt like they were competing with each other, especially with the sheer number of RPGs. There's only so much time in the day, and while not all of these games are great, there are some genuine classics here along with a bunch of unique ideas. Sure, some are on mobile and some are exclusive to Japan, but the sheer output this year from Square Enix is downright ridiculous. There were only 23 last year, which still sounds like a lot. So why did I choose to make this video? Honestly, it's something that bugged me throughout the year because there's just so much to enjoy and so little time to do it. And now that the holiday sales are rolling in, maybe you'll be reminded of something you wanted to play. But what did you think of Square Enix's 2022 game releases? Let me know in the comments, and as always, please consider subscribing to Good Vibes Gaming, hitting the like button, and ringing that bell. We also have a Patreon at patreon.com slash gvgaming with plenty of extra perks. Until next time, bye!